private journey with Jesus is just the beginning. Connecting with others intensifies our light. Together we bring hope to the world. Christ, you, me, Cola. Kia ora, good morning everybody. Good to see you all here. How many of you had a frost this morning? Most of you are up early enough to see it, I suspect. Yeah, I want you to just turn to the person next to you and show them how cold your hands are. It's called greeting one another. All right? Well, well this, um, this talk that I'm doing today is the second to last talk in our series, in the CoLab series that we're looking at through the book of Philippians. And uh, next week, uh, Pastor Colin's going to be finishing off. He, he began this whole journey for us, and so I said, you get the last, the last say. Well, um, the book of Philippians was written around about 49 to 51 AD, okay, 49 to 51 AD. And uh, 30 years later, down the road in Italy, which is a little bit further down the road from Greece where Philippi is, uh, there was an event that changed the world as respect to the small Italian coastal village, a village called Pompeii, just out of Naples. And during that time, this, this occasion happened where Mount Vesuvius erupted, as it was known to do. But in this particular situation, what happened was a cloud of heat rolled down the hill, and they reckon it was over 1,000 degrees, and uh, it instantaneously caused people to perish, to the point where, you can see in this photograph here, there's a, there's a man right at the back there who's up on his elbow, but, but the heat caught him in such intensity that it essentially cooked him on the spot. Okay, not very nice to talk about, is it? But archaeologists with their spades have been doing a great job around this uh, area, and they've dug up the remains of these villages. And what they came across when they were doing these excavations is they came across some, some plaques, some symbols that were on the outside of a number of the houses in Pompeii. And they saw this plaque, and they thought, this is rather unusual. And as you can see, it's, got, it's called the Rotas symbol. And you can see down the bottom here, R-O-T-A-S, but then it goes R-O-T-A-S, and it goes all the way around with these, these words. And it's got um, this letter N in the middle here. No one knew what this was all about because it's something that uh, obviously is symbolic and meaningful, but no one could interpret it until one bright fellow not so long ago, playing around with it, I imagine, recognized that it was a symbol, a Christian symbol. And this is how it outworks itself. Take the letter N that was in the middle of that pattern. You just go back there, see the letter N. And then take the rest of the, 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 the uh, letters, and it forms the word paternoster. Paternoster is Latin for our Father, which is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And the four remaining letters are two A's and two um, omegas, which in the, in, the, in the Greek alphabet, is the alpha and the omega, the, the first and the last. So you can see how that is obviously at the end. Our Father encompasses the beginning and the end. And it's a wonderful symbol, isn't it? Those 25 letters have been used to, to make this, and yet it's got this symmetry about it back here, and yet it rolls out into this. I think it's tremendously clever, wouldn't you? But of course, it was used to symbolize what was going on inside the household. These folks at 79 AD, just 30 years after the book of Philippians was written, were hundreds of miles away in another country declaring their Christian faith to their neighbors. And there was a number of these plaques found along the way. And I think it's a tremendous insight into how the gospel was traveling at this time in history, uh, barely a few years after Christ, really decades-wise, and probably around a time when the when the uh, Apostle John was writing the book of Revelation. So this symbol told people that there were Christians in this home, in this household, and they took it upon themselves to take seriously their faith, which they were prepared to go public about, to say, if you come into this house, 
you will find Christians here, people who are different to the way things have always been. And uh, I think it's a fantastic symbol. Now, let's come back to um, this story of the letter written to the Philippians. We're going to get to a, a very vital stage because we're talking about relationships all the way through this letter. And Paul sees that relationships themselves are vital. There's no point having a symbol outside of your house telling you that there are Christians who live here unless those Christians are getting on well together. Uh, And in the life of the church, of course, the witness that we bring about our relationships is a real vital thing. Jesus said, they shall know you're my disciples because you love one another. And that's a big challenge and a big observation that's being made all at the same time. We trust that it's an observation, not something where people are falling short. But throughout this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, uh, Paul is raising for the, the listeners this, this story of relationships and how they work. And so Paul's talking about we shouldn't have envy and rivalry in chapter 1. And then he's talking about selfish ambition in uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. He's talking about arguing in, in, in chapter 2 and how we shouldn't look to our own interests again in chapter 2. So you've, you've got to imagine what this setting was like when this letter was first read. The setting is a little bit different to what we might have imagined. Recognizing that this small church would have gathered together when they heard that there was a letter that had come from Rome, come from Paul, come from the jail where Paul was housed. And when they heard that this letter had arrived, they would have rushed together to have this letter read to them publicly. This wasn't a matter of putting it through the photocopier or putting it through the email machine for everybody to get it simultaneously. And letters, like most literature in the day, was always read outwardly, verbally, orally, not read quietly to yourself. And so the church would have gathered. And during this time of gathering, Paul's letter would have started to unnerve a few people. Because as Paul was starting to talk about envy and rivalry, as he was talking about selfish ambition and arguing and own interests, there would have been a few nervous people within that congregation that day. Because Paul was addressing a problem that was in that church at the time. And there would have been a couple of nervous women, particularly, who were causing quite a bit of grief, it appears, within the life of this small church community. And they would have been wondering, is Paul going to take this one step further? Is Paul actually going to name who the problem is? Well, we get to the final chapter, and it's a short chapter, and we find in Philippians chapter 4 that Paul does this bold leadership thing, and he names the problem. Therefore, he says, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul's done it. He's named it. He's named the very center, the very core of this problem. And in doing so, Paul doesn't start to pull them down for what it is that they may be disagreeing about. Remember, he's had two to three chapters worth of naming how it is that Christians should behave together. No arguing, not looking at yourself more highly than you ought to, etc., etc., But now he finally names it saying, listen, those who are amongst you, who are also my co-workers, can you work with these women to try to get them back together? Because I need to remind them that they are my co-workers, my fellow workers in Christ. Now for Paul to go to the trouble of speaking to these women, it meant that they weren't incidental in the story, right? These people were people who had a significant impact on the way that the gospel was being seen and the way that the church was, uh, was conducting itself in the time. If these folks had been incidental to the story, they wouldn't have got a mention here. But most commentators say that this whole letter is orientated towards 
this final peak just before the end to name these two women and say, look, it's got to be sorted out. It's got to work out because we share a combined witness. And as far as it is up to each of you, Yodi and Syntyche, do your best to bring some form of reconciliation. We know that reconciliation needs two willing parties. Paul's appealing to them both and reminding them that they are indeed his co-workers here in Christ. It's, it's a really important thing to note that these women played an important part. But Paul had lots of women who played important parts in this whole area of sharing the gospel. Paul names Priscilla and Aquila in Romans chapter 16 when he writes this letter to them about um, how he can celebrate them being co-workers. The important thing here is that this is a couple, not a couple of women. And Priscilla is named first, being the woman in this marriage, woman in this marriage, and Aquila being a husband. Uh, so commentators would tell us that she was probably the most dominant of the leaders amongst them. Out of this couple, she was the one who was probably taking the lead in this house group. And again, in uh, Colossae, where the letter to the Colossians was written, Nympha was known as a, a leader in a household group. And so she gets a mention as well. And, uh, and so does Chloe in 1 Corinthians. And so these women are being told that they are important to Paul, important to the mission. And so for Yodia and Syntyche, them getting on together was going to make a, a big difference, a vital difference to the relationships in the church and the shared witness that they had. But let's go back now and start to see how Paul encourages these women. He doesn't berate them. He doesn't start to tell them off about their poor behavior, but he lifts them up. And this is how it goes. And I want you to just see that last sentence there in verse 3. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Notice how that is all one sentence. He talks about co-workers and people being in the book of life all in one sentence, as if the two things naturally go together. That being in the book of life also means that you're a co-worker. Paul is raising up their, their, their sights, raising up their eyes so that they can see what he sees and they can understand what they need to know about themselves. Paul is calling them to a higher place. He's saying, let your behavior be equal to what it is that you have already attained. You have already attained eternal life through accepting Christ Jesus as your Savior by allowing him to forgive your sins. Now you are already written in the book of life, and, and your behavior should reflect this. This, this uh, lifting up, putting their eyes upon eternity, is a pattern that Paul used so frequently when he talked about uh, not only, of course, heaven, but about people's behavior. Live up to that which you have already attained, Paul reminds us. In other words, you have already reached a goal. It is just a matter of getting there as you pass away from this world to the next. You are already in an eternal process. You are already in an eternal state by receiving Christ into your life. So Paul is saying, live like you already live in that place. Paul then goes on to say, because he wants to just keep lifting our eyes higher. This starts to become an ecstatic sort of set of verses where Paul causes people to get out of their body, to be beside oneself, is the word ecstasy. It's ecstatic. Paul is lifting people up so that they can see beyond the veil. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is asking us to take an otherworldly view of our problems, which is a real challenge, isn't it? A real challenge. Because we're all going to have challenges. We're all going to have problems. We're all going to struggle with sickness at some point in our lives. 
or at least see other people struggling with them, and that'll cause us to struggle. We know these things. And of course, there's a lot of first world problems that we have. First world problems like the, the speed of our broadband. How many of you have struggles with the speed of your broadband and you'd think the world had come to an end when things take forever to upload? There's a great little commercial on TV just recently. I don't know if you've seen it. It's where a mum and a dad are sitting around the dinner table and the father looks to the wife and says, are we ready? And she goes, yes, we're ready. And they've got this ecstatic look on their face. And he leans over and he pushes the internet modem off. And you hear these cries from the bedrooms as the kids, the kids uh, realize that uh, life has now become disconnected. There is no world now except the one they are living in physically. And physically, mum and dad want their presence to eat dinner together. And you just see this look of ecstasy upon the parents' faces as they uh, celebrate the power that they've reclaimed over their children's uh, lives. Now, maybe I'm overstating it, but that's what it tells me as a parent anyway. Yeah. But, you know, first world problems, um, whatever they might be, um, stuck in a traffic jam. I, I live out to Pune, and I've been reassured that the one guy who's been doing the work out there, putting that, he's almost finished. He's almost finished. I think about it six weeks ago, he must have gone on a holiday somewhere. There's nothing happened, but it's almost finished. And so I'm really encouraged by that. It's a first world problem, isn't it? It's a first world problem. But the Lord reminds us that this perspective that we have to have is an eternal perspective that will put our, our, our whole life right into a right balance. There's a story that I read many years ago when I was a young man, a story of a woman called Corey Ten Boom. Many of you would have read her stories. And uh, she was a, um, a Christian, but she was, uh, had a Jewish name, and she was sent off to a concentration camp with her sister, her older sister. And the story, the testimony talks about her being led by God into different scenarios and how God provided for her in the most trying time, probably the most trying time of all history, really, or trying time of last century anyway. And she, um, she sadly lost her sister. Her sister passed away during their time of, of imprisonment by the Nazis. But there was a particular time where she records where she was praying and she used to lead a little prayer group at the end of the corridor of the prison uh, building that she was in, and the dormitory. And she's in the, praying, in the time of praying, she said, Lord, and we thank you for the fleas. They were covered with fleas. Lord, we thank you for the fleas. And a woman came up to her afterwards and said, how can you thank God for fleas? And she said, well, the Lord says in his word, as we've got in front of us, that we should give thanks in every situation. Okay. And, um, and the lady said, surely not, fleas. And she said, we give the Lord thanks in every situation. Anyway, that same lady apparently came back to her a few days later and said, you know, I'm really, really grateful for fleas. And uh, Corey says, why? And she says, well, have you noticed that the prison guards won't come down to the end of, our, our end of the corridor because they're too scared that they're going to get infected by fleas? And so we get the space to ourselves. They don't search our beds. They don't look for our contraband. And we get to pray and do Bible studies freely. So thank God for the fleas. Yeah, I see you all scratching away there. Yeah, thank God for the fleas. Yeah, maybe you have to go to that level. I'm not sure. But when we're put in these difficult situations, uh, the Lord calls us to a place where thankfulness is our, every, is, our, is our first call, our heart's desire. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how tough life can be at any given time, God reassures us that he won't forsake us and that he'll never leave us. And that in itself is enough to create rejoicing. Even in the most difficult of times, 
when we're struggling through the big life challenges. It might be sickness, it might be death, it might be uh, uh, just circumstances that are completely out of your control and you feel like you're just being tossed around in an agitator. Even at the far side of the sea, even at the depths of the ocean, we're reassured that God is with us. And Paul goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And look, given the amount of social media that we have at our fingertips these days, uh, it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, I would stand here and I'd say, guys, watch the movies that you rent from the rental shop, you know? Well, now it's just whatever's at your fingertips. You know, can you trust what people are downloading on your Facebook? Can you trust what's being sent to you? Can you trust what you pick up on Netflix on those, those movies? You know, whatever it is, whatever conversations that you're having, we need to have a degree of self-censorship, don't we? that causes for self-control, the ability to be able to say, look, I I see this here, but I don't know if it's good for me or not. And if you've got some doubt, throw it out. And Because the Lord encourages us to look at these things that are pure, excellent, lovely, praiseworthy. And long before psychologists told us that it's all about what happens in the mind, Paul is telling us here that what goes in counts. What goes in counts, and what goes in is going to come out. So have self-control and look at the things that are praiseworthy. Yeah, that's easy to say, I know, in a world where things just literally are downloaded upon you. People say, look at this, this is funny. Well, yeah, maybe if you've got a warped sense of humor, it might be funny. Not everything is pure or praiseworthy, of course. And then Paul says something that is a real challenge to all of us. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Just have a quick look at the person next door to you. And then say to them, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Hey, that's a pretty big call, isn't it? That's a pretty big call. And yet Paul says it more than once. He says, you don't have many fathers in Christ. He talks about himself being a father. But do what I do as I seek to follow Christ, he says. Wow, wow. What Paul is saying is that in my life, you can see something that is going to help you become a better follower of Christ. A better follower of Christ. And so he's saying, I want you to do what I do. Wow. Now that challenges me at a whole lot of levels because I know for myself, I've always looked at different folks and admired their walk with the Lord, their commitment, their faith, their excellence, and, and so many people have such praiseworthy lives. And whether they know it or not, I admire the way they've raised their families or, or their spiritual devotion or their level of commitment and sacrifice. These things have always inspired me. But now as you get older and I read verses like this, I go, whoa, am I the sort of person that I could, like Paul, say, whatever you have heard from me or seen in me, put this into practice as well. Those are real challenges for us, aren't aren't they? On Friday, I went to a a funeral. It was a real privilege to be there. Uh, Elizabeth Yates uh, and her husband Adam have been in the life of our church for a long, long time. And Elizabeth's mother passed away last week, Pauline Parsonson. And uh, and the uh, the funeral was held at the, the Greton Bible Chapel. And out there, we just heard glowing story after story about Pauline's life. And at one point towards the end, one of the grandchildren got up and said, 
one of the things that we loved about Grandma is that whenever she would write to us, she would always remind us with a scripture of who we were or who the Lord was and would always remind us that she was praying for us. And they said whenever we went to Grandma's place, There was always a time in the day where she'd get her Bible and we would see her praying. And so we knew it was sincere, that this is who Grandma was. And then this grandchild said, of all the grandchildren and all the great-grandchildren that she has at the age of 89, every one of us now walk with Jesus. And I was like, wow, what? I I didn't know Pauline very well and you were to say hello to Uh, But what a privilege to hear that story being told at a funeral, something she would have known before she passed away, I'm sure. But what what a beautiful story, what a beautiful challenge, as well as an inspiration for us to to look around us and see where our own children and our own influence is being impacted upon the lives of others. You see, regardless of whether we... uh, living literally with the rotas symbol outside our door or not, we know that we are the Bible that many people will read and perhaps we're the only Bible that they will read. And so God calls us, Paul calls us, to be able to live lives together to the best of our ability. Not everything is in your control. The perfect world that you aspire to is not up to you only. It's not up to you only. But to the best of your ability, we're called to do the best by each other and and to, to call the best out of each other, to look for the best from each other and to do the best with the lives that we've been called to. And how are we inspired? We're not inspired by intimidating one another into good behavior. We are inspired because when we look to the cross of Christ, We see what Jesus has done for us. We say, what more can I do but give my life to him who passed away dying for me, taking upon his body my sins. And so Paul talks about the love of Christ that constrains him, yeah? That pulls him together. When you're constrained, you're tightened up. The loose, liberal sloppy bits of your life are no longer let loose. You are constrained in Christ that you might prove your worth to him because he loved you first. Isn't that awesome? Let's stand. Father, we thank you that as your people called by your name, with our names in the eternal book of life, we have been given the opportunity to live this life daily together and to be inspired by one another. And indeed, even as Paul corrected those, those uh, companions of his, so too we are called to be corrected. But we are called to put our eyes on heavenly things, to dwell upon that which is perfect, which is praiseworthy, which is beautiful. And in doing so, God, we are reminded of where we are heading and whom we are. We're not called to the things of this world. We're called to the things that you make eternal, and that includes us. Our relationships with you, our relationships with one another. And so, God, we thank you for this letter that was written in a specific way for a specific purpose and yet resonates with all of us. And so we give thanks for the argument that Yodia and Syntyche had. For we give thanks for all things. We give you thanks for the disagreement that we would only hope was reconciled. But it gave us a letter that allows us once again to see the mirror of Scripture and see our lives being outworked through that. We ask your blessing upon your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.